now, which this is uh, this is breaking today on Friday, 6-18-21. The Boston Celtics traded Kemba Walker first and then some other pieces for um, Al Horford was the main guy and then some other pieces as well. But um, what are your guys' thoughts on this? You can go from, I guess, Thunder side, Celtic side, or overall, Mo, I'm kicking it to you. Yeah, so I can definitely understand why they would trade Kemba in the sense that when I would watch the Celtics, I wasn't nearly as impressed with Kemba game in, game out as I was Brown and Tatum. However, it's a matter of what they got. So they they got Horford and they got Moses Brown, who could be bigs, and especially they would give more relief to Robert Williams, who I think is a very talented big on that team. But then the question comes in, and I think – um, someone just says, but who's the point guard going to be? Yeah, Jaeger just asked who the point guard's going to be. That's kind of the question: is who who's going to step up to be the facilitator? As um, someone who watched a couple of Celtics games, a good amount, I would say the person who stood out to me would be Peyton Pritchard. I was very impressed by his play this season. Um, so I'm going to be curious who kind of said like the other guys could be um, Romeo Langford or Carson Edwards. It's definitely going to be interesting what they do. Um, but I thought the trade makes sense in the fact that Kemba didn't impress me too much there, but did they really get much more in return um, is my question. So those are my initial thoughts. Interesting. So I'll touch on it. I thought trading Kemba Walker was great. I don't think they should have signed Kemba Walker for the money they signed him in, in the first place. I thought their biggest problem with their team at that point was Kyrie Irving and chemistry. And I thought I thought Brown and Tatum were ascending stars and there was no need to go sign another guy who's going to monopolize the ball in Kemba Walker, who doesn't play great defense and isn't particularly great off the ball. And Kemba Walker, in the last two playoffs, he was really bad against Toronto. Um, in the bubble, and he was terrible against the Nets. I think he shot like 32% from the floor and like 18% from three. It was some ugly, ugly numbers from Kemba Walker this year. And he's also a guy to me that's starting to get injured a bit more and starting to lose his quick first step, which to me is what separated Kemba Walker in the first place. So I think it's a good move. I thought Big Al actually played okay for the Thunder. I was a little surprised. Now, he didn't play a lot, but when he did play, I thought he played okay. And I think he would be a nice, welcome addition for the Celtics who still have a thin front court. Though, as you mentioned, Robert Williams is a beast and he is be- way better than like I ever knew, like watching him burst the nets and stuff. He is an explosive athlete. He could maybe be like a Clint Capella type, but this brings to the third question and you answered it, right? Cause you, you answered in-house. You think Peyton Pritchard could be the guy. I think Marcus Smart does a good job hand running their offense, and I think their offense always ran more efficient when Smart ran it than when Kemba Walker did because I thought Smart found Brown and Tatum better. But, but, but I think the guy they need to sign, and now I think the cap with this is going to be tricky, but I think this is what the doctor ordered for the Boston Celtics. There's a guy that's a free agent, and one of the first Hoops with Noel episodes we did, we talked about how the Boston Celtics should trade for this guy, and to me that's Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry should be if to me the Boston Celtics are a win now team. This is an elite duo, wing duo in Brown and Tatum. They need a tough point guard who can distribute. He can make timely shots. You know the kind of effect that maybe CP3 had on Devin Booker and Mikel Bridges. And I think Tatum and Brown are way better than both of those guys. Maybe Booker's as good as both, but you know Bridges is a good player, not at that level. Obviously Lowry isn't as good as CP3, but I think he was exactly what the doctor ordered. For the Boston Celtics, if they can find a way to get Kyle Lowry, they still have Evan Fournier, who's pretty good, in my opinion, a crafty scorer. He would be the ideal sixth man to score off your bench. Marcus Smart is still a good two-way player, though he sometimes takes some questionable three-pointers. But uh, overall, I think that if Boston found a way to get Kyle Lowry, I, I think their prospects in 2021-2022 and 20, or in 2021-2022 could change drastically. Interesting. So I kind of have same thoughts as you guys. I'll start with the Celtics part of the trade. I think this whole year, both of us has been banging on the door for Kemba Walker to be traded because he just, he just didn't, he wasn't it for the Celtics. And it seems clear to me that they're not, they don't need this quote unquote elite point guard. They had Isaiah Thomas a few years ago. They traded him. They had Kyrie. They had Kemba Walker. They keep going after these, you know, the next best thing at point guard. 
I, I feel like they don't need to do that. I, th- I feel like a solid, solid veteran in having Marcus Smart there. I love Marcus Smart. I think he's just great for the team overall. He's a, he's just a Boston player, and everyone loves him, and he loves the city and all that. But I, I think Lowry would be nice. Maybe Lonzo. I don't know. They just need someone who can be kind of like CP3 and be more of a floor general. Because, like you said, Vish, Brown and Tatum are an amazing duo. I think they're like, if there's like Paul George and Kawhi, they're like just below that. I think they can be kind of like that. They don't need a guy who's a score first point guard. They just don't. Kemba is not, and that's more of what Kemba is, but th- that is not what they need. Um, and I think the, getting Al Horford back is pretty solid. Like, I think he'll be good on the team. He never made sense with the fit in Philly. That just, I guess that <laughs> didn't really make sense from day one unless they're playing in the mid 2000s, but we are 15 years past that. So that just didn't make sense. Um, and then they freed up around 23 million cap space overall, just a rough estimate. So they have some funds. I want to say, do they have to sign Evan Fournier this offseason? I want to say he might be up. Um, his contract might be up. You might have to check me on that, Vish. But um, let me look it up right now because I, I thought he had one more year. Okay. Yeah, Evan Fournier. Yup, you're right. He's an un, he's an unrestricted free agent. So I you're feel right. like yep, they'll yep, yep. probably re-sign him back and then maybe go cheap at point guard. Um, we'll see. Peyton Pritchard might develop and be that guy. Marcus Smart's a dog. I'm I'm cool with him there. But um, bottom line, I guess that provides a little cap flexibility, and Al Horford will be solid for them. Now let's get over to the Thunder side of the trade because this is. What Sam Presti is doing is this dude is playing 2K pretty much. He will trade for a player that nobody likes or thinks is washed. He'll trade for Al Horford. He'll trade for Chris Paul. And then they'll play well on the team. They'll get a lot of minutes. They'll look all right. And then he'll flip them for a first or multiple firsts. And I think they're going to do that with Kemba. I wouldn't be surprised if Kemba plays pretty well on the Thunder and eventually gets flipped. I think the next guy that they're going to get is Kristaps Porzingis and do the whole site. Like, this is just a reoccurring cycle, and I think they're going to get Kristaps and do it. I'm, I'm dead serious. It, it'll happen. Just wait. Kristaps will be a, th- uh, a Thunder soon. But um, in all seriousness, the Thunder either need to they, – they need to make some – they need to make moves in the near future. They either need to trade these picks and package them for a star, which they've been trading stars to get all these picks, or they need to – they need to sign some free agents, which I think that's going to be harder to do because they are small market, but they have to do something. I don't think you can just roll in and with a bunch of lotto picks and just build a team that way. Now it might work. We, you know, he did draft three um, MVPs, although granted they were top five picks, a couple of them being, you know, very obvious picks like KD, but they have drafted well in the past. They have found guys in the mid mid to late areas like Serge Ibaka and Reggie Jackson, who were, I want to say lotto picks are in the twenties that have turned out to have really good careers. So something tells me they're either going to make a big trade or they're going to sign a free agent because they have, I think 16 picks in the next few years, which is absurd. I mean, it is like one of us playing 2K and just hoarding first round picks. He needs an intervention. Sam Preston needs an intervention um, on trading for first round picks and second round picks too, because he's hoarding them. <laughs> it, it's it's concerning. I mean, I mean honestly, like what what do they plan on doing? Just having like thirteen or fourteen like people on rookie contracts? I I don't think that's feasible. I think I, it'll be a trade of, at some point. Or another. So I have a guess, and I want to hear your thoughts on the guess. My guess is that he's going to try to hit uh, the jackpot in one of these next two drafts. Mm-hmm. And if he hits it, if he picks, because James Harden wasn't an obvious pick, and he nailed that one. Russell Westbrook wasn't an obvious pick. He nailed that one. Kevin Durant, like you mentioned, was, and he nailed that one too. So I think if he manages to nail it, get that guy, whoever it is, whether it's, you know, a Kate Cunningham, Mimoni Bates, Chet, one of these guys, whoever's the hyped up guy, whoever he picks him, and that guy looks like his next superstar with Shy Gilgis Alexander, I think at that point he'll start to move future picks because he has nothing to build around at this moment. Because Shy Gilgis Alexander is a really, really good player. You don't want to build your entire franchise around Shy Gilbert. Yeah, I agree. And I think it, it will be important for him, or it will help a lot more if he can maybe hit this lottery pick or like a sleeper guy sooner rather than later because he still has if, – if he can get a roster he's happy with, then he can – instead of hoarding these picks, as Blake's brought up, he's got so many. 
who can actually trade them for a free agent because if they had a little bit more talent could be more of a destination for other people to kind of come and join the team whereas i think right now if he if he has some bad drafts he's gonna be looked at like an idiot he's gonna have all these picks didn't do anything he flipped a couple of players made a playoff run with cp3 that was cool um but yeah outside of that it's gonna look pretty stupid so i hope that kemba plays pretty well there i don't think it'll make too much of a difference but the draft is the x factor for this team and of course the i i think at this point it's probably a three people the goat conversation where it's lbj jordan and lou dort so a matter of lou dort plays up to his potential i think he's got only potential to go up there so um, but yeah, the draft is the X factor for sure. Yeah, and I, I honestly think like you know we joke about this, but what they're do- what he's doing is really smart. You know, he'll take he'll take on a bad contract, a la what was seen as potentially Chris Paul because he looked to be he he kept getting injured in the playoffs for the Rockets, right? Like they they wanted to make a move and they thought Russell Westbrook would be better. They traded Chris Paul and picks to get Westbrook. Uh, clearly, that did not turn out well for. For them, I mean, their whole franchise is gone when Harden left, but that's beside the point. Um, and then they traded for Al Horford because his contract looked terrible and, you know, it was immovable. So they got first for that and they just take on these bad contracts um, and then just accumulate picks. And then tr- they flip the players that everyone thought was just a net negative and they get more picks. It's it's a crazy cycle and it's kind of genius, but at some point you need to say either A, we're going to surround, you know, our team with actual talent and start trying to win or we're going to, you know, trade all these picks and hopes to, you know, get the next LeBron, get the next Zion. And maybe that's a Moni Bates. Maybe that's Chet. I, I guess we don't know. And um, I guess they need to have, so I'm sure he has some plan in place to do this, but you, you can't just go in with a team with a bunch of lotto picks because lotto picks are very, very hit or miss. And I'd say NBA, it's miss more than make. Right. Now, there is there is exceptions, you know. There is your Giannis's, there is your Donovan Mitchell, there is your I want to say Jamal Murray was like the seventh or eighth pick or something like that. But overall, unless you're getting top five, like a top five player, like there is a significant drop off in the NBA for top like three picks, like from pick three to six is a major drop off usually. Yep. And like you mentioned with you know, he has to find these guys in the draft. I think that's going to be the key in all of that. And then I just wanted to go back to your Philly point with Al Horford. What do you think they were doing? They were trying to, you know, the Pistons, one of the most progressive organizations in the NBA. Everybody wants to be like the Detroit Pistons. If you remember uh, back in the mid 2010s, the Detroit Pistons thought that it was genius to put together a roster with Josh Smith, Andre Drummond, and Greg Monroe in the front court. And they also had Rodney Stuckey as one of their guards who couldn't shoot a lick. Uh, the the Philadelphia 76ers were trying to follow that formula by pairing Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, and Al Horford, thinking that that was going to work. So I my Pistons are just inspiring the NBA. Like, it's, it's just what they do. Apparently. I mean, they <laughs> – I would say it was more of in, in hopes to try to stop Giannis and just get as many big dudes out there, but – you know that works one year, and then the next year you play a team that doesn't that doesn't have Giannis, or, and they have uh, I want to say Kawhi Leonard or just that type of a team. They, so they got whipped by Boston without Ben Simmons, but I think you're right on. I think they thought that the East just goes through Giannis, and if we shut down Giannis, we're okay. Well, there's other teams than Mil- Milwaukee in the East, and you know, like a Miami comes on strong. A Boston still has Tatum and Brown, so like. It was a little kind of like they thought, like, you know, gearing to stop LeBron, which kind of what the East was trying to do for the whole 2010s. But it, it, it just turns out that Giannis is quite not clearly as good as LeBron James is, which who would have thought? But um, that, that, that conversation 